Thanks. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is um, Danielle johnson Vermonton, and I will be your speaker for today and tomorrow. Um, so as you know, today's topic and tomorrow is emergency disaster response. Um, we have a, a lot to talk about and a lot to cover. Um, we'll start off with some housekeeping. Or actually, we'll start off with introductions, sorry. <clears throat> I have been at Blackboard, um, and I used to be at Convio, for about two and a half years, and I am on the GO team, um, which is a program here where we work with uh, new clients to illuminate online, and we take them through 12 months of best practices, tactics, and tool training um, using Luminate Online, really concentrating on um, online fundraising and marketing. Um, before that, <clears throat> excuse me, I spent 13 years in the field actually doing fundraising, um, much of that at the American Red Cross at the chapter level in Broward County, Florida, um, and also at the national level. So I have responded to my fair share of disasters, um, really concentrating on fundraising, but also doing um, public relations and media um, management, um, which is always interesting, um, doing feeding, um, every, everything that you could think of. So I have a lot of experience and a lot of insight into that, as well as um, other organizations like working for the Boys and Girls Clubs and PBS and NPR, doing everything from major gifts with individuals and corporations to grants and special events. So I have a wealth of knowledge, and I always love to share it. Um, so I hope you'll get a lot out of today. It might not all be new information, um, but I hope I'll inspire you to think of some things that might be new and that you can change or do differently. Um, Kent, I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, if you've been on the webinar before, you have heard my Oklahoma accent far too much. I am Kent Gillum, the Luminate Community Manager. I uh, work on the program development team where we put together all the free kits and manage the CCC and stuff. So if you ever have any questions or anything, you can always get in touch with me just by emailing luminatecommunity at blackbod.com, and I, I can help you out. So some housekeeping before we get going. Um, to keep the noise down, we're going, we've muted all of the phones. Uh, please chat in your questions. Kent's going to monitor and respond, and he will stop me um, if it's something that um, he wants me to chime in on <clears throat> and give my opinion. And of course, we'll stop periodically throughout the session to see if there are questions. After the webinar, the slides and recording will be posted in the community for downloading as well as you'll receive a follow-up email with that information so you don't have to go search for it. There will also be a thread in the community where you can post questions, whether that's questions about the kit when you start to use it, or questions <clears throat> about disaster fundraising and response in general. So I hope you get a lot out of today. So the agenda for day one, we're going to talk about creating a disaster fundraising plan. We're going to look at some main areas that need to be included. And of course, there can be more than this, but these are really um, the foundational areas of what should be in any fundraising plan. Um, communications, fundraising appeals, acknowledgments, in-kind policy, and events. Um, day two, tomorrow we're going to talk about implementation for a little bit. Um, the disaster has struck, now what? So we'll talk about in those immediate couple of days what you need to do. And then um, a topic near and dear to my heart is donor conversion. <clears throat> can you convert disaster-only donors into annual donors? Um, and I can say with all confidence, you can. Um, I've done it um, and had a lot of success. And it does take some creativity, but I think it's a lot of fun. And I'll sh talk to you about some examples um, online and print. And then we'll go over what's in the kit. And um, I'm really excited about this kit because we've been meeting over the last couple of weeks to talk about it. And we've added some really cool, to, uh, cool features and tools that I think will help you um, in developing this plan. <clears throat> so organizations that respond to and provide relief after disasters already have a plan. <clears throat> when you talk about your Salvation Armies, um, some of your food banks, your American Red Cross, they probably already have a plan. But what do you do if disaster strikes and your organization is thrown into relief efforts? By the nature of perhaps what you do, it makes sense for you to step up. Or perhaps the severity of the disaster, you decide as an organization, we need to step up and help. Um, there's a gap there. Or what do you do if your services and mission are actually impacted? Um, you've lost power to your offices. You have to pr stop providing services. Your facility has been damaged. So what do you do if you're that organization? Because it's two very different things and two very different stories. So we're going to talk about that today because you might not necessarily, most likely, 
have a disaster fundraising plan. Um, and I think it's the biggest thing is to be prepared, <clears throat> as the Red Cross says. So the goal is to create a disaster fundraising and communications plan <clears throat> that everyone on your staff will be able to use. And the benefit, um, other than peace of mind, um, that you have this already written down, is an informed team that's going to know the steps to implement once a disaster strikes. Um, the, the last thing you want is for that disaster to come whipping through, whether it's a forest fire, a hurricane, a flood, whatever it may be, um, and you haven't sat down with staff and talked about the different elements we're going to go over. That is certainly not the time to try to figure that out, especially if you need to fundraise, but at the same time you need to deal with your disaster because it's hit home closely. So what's that process look like? You're going to meet with key staff to discuss and draft this plan because it's more than just the fundraising staff that need to be involved. Get buy-in from management, most importantly. Um, once it is approved, don't keep it a secret. It needs to be disseminated to staff, and not just your program managers or your department heads, depending upon um, the structure of your organization. It needs to go to everyone. Um, and keep copies handy for reference. Don't just have one copy in the Director of Development's office. Um, that's, the, that would, that's when it's handy to have it with each program director, each manager, that they have it handy for their department. Because let's say the only copy is in the director of development's office and that person has been directly impacted and they can't even get into the office, you certainly don't want it to be stuck in there. <clears throat> and then you want to update this periodically. So when we're talking about communications, what are the different segments? Um, you've got your donors and constituents, your board of directors, media and public relations, and social and website. So those are the areas we're going to focus on. There's obviously a couple of other groups, but these are really the main groups um, that are, I don't want to say most important, but are probably the largest and that you really need to think through what you're going to say to them. So for your donors and constituents, <clears throat> utilize email for quick and timely communication. Print communication is going to be very difficult. And it might not even be possible depending upon how the area has been impacted. So really utilize Luminate Online um, to do your communications and updates. Um, do you already have a monthly e-news that may be going out? I worked with a client that went through this recently with, San with Hurricane Superstorm Sandy. Use it to report on the impact of the disaster. Um, hijack that e-news, scrap whatever articles you may have had planned to go out and use it to talk about what's going, to, what's going on um, with the disaster response. Um, was an appeal scheduled, whether that's online or frankly direct mail, you need to delay it and evaluate when it will be appropriate to launch. <laughs> you may already have the direct mail appeal printed at the mail house. There's obviously probably nothing you can do at that point. Um, but if it is at a point in the process where you can pause and cancel it to have a discussion, I really recommend you do that. Um, whether you're an organization that's now providing relief efforts or an organization that's been impacted and your offices have been damaged or even destroyed or facility that you run, like a mission, um, you really need to pause and think about, okay, what do we need to do? Is this the right time to even send out an appeal? Probably not. Or do we need to pull this appeal back, postpone it, and send a different type of appeal? Um, what's that pre-flight checklist look like when you're thinking about these communications? Who's going to be responsible for creating and sending these communications? List that position in the plan. Actually outline these in sections and list who is going to be responsible. Perhaps it's just the position, maybe not the person's name, um, because that could obviously change. But who's going to be responsible for creating and sending these? Who needs to approve the email before it goes out? Um, you definitely want to streamline that process. If it's usually your CEO and your board chair, that might not work in this scenario. So can it just be the director of development, or can it just be the executive director and maybe um, one other person? Are there groups to target or suppress? You don't need to put that query together. Um, but I do recommend within the plan, you should put in there who might need to be suppressed especially and who might need to be targeted. So you can just put that information that perhaps a group of donors for the last month or, or whatever it may be, um, you need to think about who that is and at least broad strokes, write that into the plan. Um, and you, know, you want to have that written down so that anyone that's coming in and looking this will know what's what those next steps are. 
and you've enabled the people around you to really own this process and it not just be you. Um, also looking at print communications, um, how can you do quick updates um, and even appeals if you need to? You're probably sending out thank you letters. Um, if you are, if, if the area hasn't been impacted, but maybe you're just pr providing relief efforts, you could quickly print out inserts and put them into acknowledgment letters that were already going out the door. Use a vendor to send an emergency direct mail appeal. The Red Cross and the Salvation Army have huge partnerships with national vendors like Rizard that can do this within 24 hours. Um, if you don't have a vendor um, that you already work with, consider doing some research and identifying one or two vendors that you could potentially work with that could do something that quickly in a turnaround. Um, you could do an appeal in-house. Perhaps you're not, your organization isn't that big. You only have a list of about 1,500 people to send this to. You could certainly do this in-house, recruit a few volunteers to come in. Um, decide again who that target list will be. Write it down in the plan. Um, is there a newsletter and a report that's coming out soon that you could put an appeal in there, even just an insert, throw in, um, make the cover page of that newsletter um, the appeal, or if it's coming out in four to five weeks, that might be a good opportunity to think about adding an update on what relief efforts are going on. So those are things to consider when you're looking at print and online communications. What are some of the things you want to tell your constituents? Um, did the disaster affect the services you provide? Did it halt services? Um, what's the impact to the client? Or, or if you're an animal, organi or animal rights um, at, you know, SPCA organization, what's the impact to the animals um, and to the services you offer to the community, to your rescue, rescue efforts? How will you get back online? Not on to illuminate online, but literally how will you get back to business? That's important to be able to tell that story. Um, is your organization mobilized to, prov to provide relief efforts? If that wasn't part of your mission, but you've made the decision, or in some ways it's kind of imperative that you've stepped up to the plate, why was that decision um, made to get involved? I think that's important to tell people and can be very powerful. Um, it certainly positions you as um, someone that um, is involved in your community, it can be flexible as an organization, is really stepping up when, when you need to. And what are you doing? Include statistics. When you start to really provide those relief efforts, how much food are you distributing? Um, how many care packages are you sending out? How many people might you be feeding? Um, how many phone calls have you been receiving if you open up a mini phone bank? Um, stuff like that. How many animals have you rescued? Um, so those are important statistics to track while you're doing this, because those are powerful to include, especially when you're starting to do your fundraising appeals. How can people help? Um, people want to volunteer. They want to donate goods. They want to donate money. So these are the type of things that you need to think about. Um, some of this you can um, put into the plan of, of ways that people can get involved. Some of this will be decided within that first couple of days, depending upon the disaster. But you really want to talk about how people can help, because many times they're clamoring to help. And from experience, it is better to give them direction than to let them figure out what they want to do, because that can create a whole other set of problems. And stories of hope, be on the lookout for inspirational and moving stories from the field. Tell your staff to be on the lookout for those things and to keep that top of mind. And when appropriate, take pictures of um, your organization in action to share, and obviously get <clears throat> media releases signed. So an example of a donor communication, this is an organization I worked with that <clears throat> wasn't providing relief to the community, but they were impacted because their offices lost power. <clears throat> People couldn't even get into the office to provide services. So they, <clears throat> excuse me, they had a solicitation that was about to go out. And instead, instead of using their e-news to profile um, their upcoming campaign, they changed the first article to talk about the impact that they um, experienced based on Hurricane Sandy and how they were dealing with that, and at the same time saying their thoughts and prayers were with the community. Um, so they really used their regularly scheduled e-news that was going to wrap into their campaign to start off with that acknowledgement and that story. And then they talked about why they were concerned that the impact of the campaign would affect their largest holiday drive of the year. And they really went out to people and said, please 
you know, that whole turn of phrase, now more than ever, we need your help because some of these corporations that provide hundreds of pounds and thousands of pounds of canned food and donations might not be able to because they're doing relief efforts. And we might have more people coming to us this year because they're without food and homes because of the, the storm. So that's how they dealt with the communication and still held their, their drive, but still recognized that people were hurting um, and in need. So when it comes to communications, your board of directors is another group of people you're going to want to keep in the loop. Um, you're probably going to need to have some meetings with them. Conference calls are good. Utilize the technology to do a conference call. What types of things do they need to do know? Regular updates from the CEO and other key staff, but consolidate it into one report. Some of this seems very common sense, but when disaster strikes, it's good to have these things written down for other people to know. Um, they're going to want to know the impact of services, facilities, staff, and fundraising. Um, don't forget to let them know. If 50% of your staff have been directly impacted and can't even come into the office to work, I think the board really needs to know about that um, because they might be able to step up and help. Um, tell them what's coming up in the fundraising disaster plan. You can share a copy of it with them or let them know what next steps are so they know. Um, let them know if you've had media inquiries and how you've dealt with it and let them know who that point of contact is um, in the organization who's dealing with those and what do you need from them. Be very clear and ready to tell them what you need them to, to do for the organization. So when it comes to media and public relations, um, this can be a tricky one, so being prepared is so important. Identify the point of contact within your organization. Make sure everyone knows who that person is if the media shows up or starts to call. Um, make sure they know to refer questions to whoever that person is. And make sure staff know if they're allowed to respond to media inquiries, and you, the answer should be no. No one else but one or two key people should answer anything that the media asks. Um, you want that for control, you want that for damage control, and you want that to make sure that you're pitching the right story. Have a boilerplate, a boilerplate press release ready so that if you have to send out um, press releases, and you, you will, about what um, is going on at your organization, that you've got a press release that will address um, information, the facts that need to be included just for disaster response. Um, be prepared with statistics about the impact to your organization or relief efforts. Like I mentioned before, very similar to what you would communicate to donors and constituents, the media is going to want to know that information, so try to track it. And what will you do, and think about this as a team, and um, you know, put a blurb in your disaster plan, what are you going to do if they show up at the door? Um, or what will you do if you're out feeding people or collecting donations like food and blankets and clothes? What are you going to do if they show up? Um, you might, if you're going to be going out and doing a feeding effort um, and you want to publicize that so people know to come to it, or you're going out to collect donations like cl clothes and food, um, there's a good, good chance the media might show up. So designate someone at that, at that event to either answer questions or they have that person, the point of contact cell phone number at the ready. Depending upon the scale of the disaster, consider as an organization having someone that's going to have a cell phone on them 24 hours a day um, because you might get phone calls at midnight. Um, I've been there. It happens, especially if the media wants what they think might be a scoop or the leading story. If you were directly impacted, Something I wanted to put in here because it's happened to me oh so many times, and if you don't think about it, it can sideswipe you quickly and, and you can be unprepared. If you're directly impacted or you're providing services, be prepared if a radio or television station calls and wants to hold a telethon. And you might think, oh, that's great, that they'll just bring all the money in. They could. Um, but you need to talk about as an organization, do you want to participate? Because it's not as easy as they're just going to do it. They're going to need someone on, at your organization to help them co-manage the event. They're going to probably want a couple of representatives there to be interviewed on air. I've never had one where they don't want your folks to come in, your organization to come in and actually answer the phones and write down the donations. Um, what are the pros and the cons to participating? And if you do it, be sure to update the website with information about the event. Um, so it really is something to think about. It sounds wonderful. But a radio and television um, fundraiser are actually a lot of work. 
and can pull really needed resources away from your organization to run it. So it might just be a paragraph in the plan, but these are some things you need to think about as an organization. And of course, some of these things you'll address when it happens, um, depending upon what the TV or radio station offers and wants to do. But it's certainly something to at least talk about as a, as, um, a, a department or as an organization with key staff and write something in the manual about how it should be handled if a request comes in. So when it comes to social media, keep the conversation going. Social media next to email is going to be your most immediate way to update and engage and mobilize people. So post updates on all of your social media assets. Even if one of those assets is YouTube, um, if you've got some short videos that you can take, even if it's a 60-second video of your CEO giving an update on relief efforts, that's a great thing to post on YouTube. Um, pictures, you can post those on Pinterest. Um, and then people can pin them. So post your updates on social media. Um, engage your fans, your friends, your followers with information, questions, and opportunities to help. Ask them to take action. For lack of a better word, Ask them if you can hijack their Facebook page or their Twitter feed for a day, and if they will post information and updates for you. Um, th they're there because they're passionate about your organization. They're there because they want to hear from your organization. And more than anything, they're there because they want to have a conversation and a dialogue. That's what social media is all about, not just seeing the updates, but actually doing something for you. Um, another idea, provide a timeline photo for your fans to use on their page. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, really easy to do. I can create them on my computer all day, every day. It just, it's taking a really great photo, um, cutting it to be the, you know, um, editing it to be the right size, and adding some uh, short text on top of it, or even just your logo on the top of it. And that's all you need to do. Upload it in your pictures, and someone can take that and upload their timeline photo. Identify someone to manage the updates and respond when people comment or send messages. Um, I went to a, a training recently, and it really resonated with me. And it's really frustrating, because I have done this. I have sent a message through Facebook to a business asking them a question and expressing my frustration about an experience. And it took them over a month to get back to me. Would you ignore an email for that long from a constituent? That's essentially what you're doing. If someone puts a comment on your page and asks a question, or sends you a message through Facebook or another um, social media tool, if you don't respond to them in a couple of days, you're essentially ignoring an email. So really think about that. That's important. Even outside of a disaster, if you don't have someone that's responding to people making comments and asking questions on Facebook, whatever it may be, Twitter, YouTube, um, or if you have that feature enabled, or they're sending a message through that directly to the organization, you need to have someone that's monitoring that, and that responds within about 24 to 48 hours. So that's something to think about. Use social media. It's a great asset during disasters. It's very powerful. So here's an example of one of the powerhouses, in my opinion, the powerhouse when it comes to disaster fundraising, an example of the American Red Cross. Um, they've got a great timeline photo there at the top. Um, up in, I'm not sure if it's New Jersey, but up in the area that was hit by Hurricane Sandy. And this was just today. So it's still up there because it's still relevant. It hasn't gone away. Folks are still responding. Um, and what you'll see it is an example of, I gave something that means something. They have a number of profile pictures that people can grab. It was during the holidays and update their profile pictures so it's not a picture of them and their family or just their, you know, their headshot. They actually provided those so that people that really support the organization, that are passionate about the Red Cross, in the month of December could swap that out. And that's really powerful. And then you'll see um, to the right the um, timeline photo they created. They, have a num they had a number of these that, again, their fans, their followers, could take that and take it from their picture album and swap it out for their cover photo on their timeline which I thought was really great, and I really like this idea. And then they have pictures of thank you cards from children. So another thing to think about, as you might start to get thank you letters, especially if you get artwork from kids, it would be really great to take some of those and post those on Facebook or even Pinterest.
Um, your website is another important area to think about um, when communicating. It might seem very, well, yeah, we get that. But I am always surprised, especially when I was working with clients after Hurricane Superstorm Sandy, how many organizations I never saw anything updated on their website, ever. And that amazed me. So don't think it's common sense because you might be pulled in so many different directions when the disaster happens that someone else might not actually think about it. Um, and things are so overwhelming at that point and you're getting so many requests from so many different people and especially if you were the one impacted, maybe you can't even come into the office and you have to work from home, um, you want to have this written down in the plan. Um, put press releases on your website. List ways to help right on your home page. People are not going to dig for ways to help. Um, tell your story. Create a page on your website that's completely dedicated to what you're doing. Whether you're impacted or providing relief efforts, don't just have an article up there. Create a page, and I'm going to show you some examples of some really um, great built out areas on two different websites that really told this organization's story and listed what they were doing. Create a disaster giving donation form. Um, if you need to collect donations, your organization might not want to, um, but create, if you do, use Luminate Online and create a dedicated donation form. It's really important because disaster gifts need to be designated and you need to be able to report on them. And then include links to resources, especially if your organization is near the impacted area or in the impacted area. Um, post resources. Um, the American Red Cross is going to have feeding stations and comfort stations and give out comfort kits and disaster kits. Post that information on your website. Link people to other resources. couple other things. Your website is the key to the outside world. It's where people are going to go, even people that aren't in the area. If they know about your organization, if a friend told them about your organization, they may want to go and help you. Um, so make sure you know who to call to get it updated. If your website isn't built so that you can update some of the information on your own, have the number and the name of the vendor or the person who does it in the plan so that someone else can call them and talk to that person or vendor and say to them, look, if we're hit, if the disaster strikes at home and your office is out of commission, what's your backup plan? Ask them that because that's the last thing you want to find out is that they didn't have one. And they might not have even thought about it, so it's good to have that conversation. Use Luminate Online to make life easier. Use Story Builder to create that page I talked about where you can list ways to help, where you can tell your story and update people on what you're doing. Um, use surveys. If you, I'm going to talk in a little bit about um, using surveys to collect information. So if you want to collect inquiries from people that want to volunteer because you don't have the resources and the time to take all of that information over the phone, use surveys to put up an um, inquiry form for people to submit. Use the donation form and donation management to create a dedicated form. Um, use page builder. Um, use that to create pages for your website. And you, know, you can use Story Builder, you can use Page Builder to do that. So those are several tools that you have that you're paying for that you can use to make life easier. Put that information in the plan. Um, you know, put information in there about a disaster donation form needs to be created, um, and this is where you go to create that. Um, use Story Builder so that people know they don't have to jump in. Write it down so that people know what to do when disaster strikes. You want to give them a map, basically. Any questions so far? I know I'm covering a lot of information. I'm curious, and you can certainly chat this in, have any of the organizations on the phone um, been had to experience any disasters and had to do disaster fundraising um, and weren't necessarily prepared um, to do that? It was new for your organization to face. And you can chat it in or, or come off of mute at star six if you want to come off of mute. I, um, I'll share my example that from recent, when we tried to raise money for Hurricane Sandy relief, we actually found out that we had an issue with our merchant services account. And that was something that we didn't expect. We hadn't um, had experienced any other problems with our online fundraising. And then all of a sudden, a change was made and we lost the ability to process donations for two days during the middle of our 
you know, our initial fundraising campaign. And that was something that we didn't even think of to 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 check, to, to manage it. We thought that, that was you know, we were one and done. So that's yeah, another I would thing have I, I would have assumed that too. <laughs> Wow, was it because they were impacted and and their office was damaged or destroyed or you know I I, I would say it really took us um, two days. You know, at first it I mean and there were different. It was pretty murky. Um, at first it was sort of a hey something's wrong. Let's just try and figure out what's wrong. Let's you know and it took us maybe uh, 12 hours to determine that that was the issue. This happened on a Saturday. Um, so our response time was not as fast as it could be because most of the folks in you know the merchant services land don't work on Saturdays and Sundays, so or the financial services industry. So um, it took us a while to uh, diagnose the issue, and then it took us a while to figure out how exactly we needed to handle the issue. Um, one of those issues um, was that was reaching out to Convio. Um, Initially that morning, that Saturday morning, when, when we sort of scrambled to figure out what was the problem, um, I couldn't access, I was on my cell phone away from my computer, so I couldn't ask, access Convia support. Um, I didn't realize at the time that in order to get a Priority One ticket, you have to do that um, via email, and that wasn't something I had access to. So um, I fortunately was you know, found a uh, someone and you know high up on the food chain who sort of direct you know got me connected to the right people via cell phone. But after we did that, that was hurdle number one. After we did that, you know hurdle number two um, was figuring out what the issue was, and um, we figured out that it did have to do with our merchant services account that we weren't able. That's why we weren't able to process donations. And then hurdle number three was working with the right folks to figure out how to solve that problem and eventually it all got taken care of it just was not as fast as we would have liked and we think yeah, those two days were critical but yeah that's certainly my goodness and that that's one of those things that's probably not going to happen to too many people but I'm guessing it really helped you learn about some of the resources and things that you needed to have in place to be able to respond quickly well wow I'm glad, you were, able to, glad you were able to figure that out and thank you for sharing that I appreciate that now, I, um, I think if I had to make one more final point, it would just be to say that, you know, when you tighten a screw or loosen a screw somewhere else, you know, there's going to be ramifications of it, and, and that's ultimately what happened is um, we went in a different direction for another project with our, you know, e-commerce account, and that affected what we thought would be a safe space or merger services agreement, and in order, you know, all it took was a mouse click to solve all of our problems, but it was finding the right person with the right mouse to you know, click on the right button, um, and it you know it was a a frustrating process, but a rewarding one. You know, we're looking back on it, and like you said, we did learn quite a bit about how uh, transactions are processed. So that hopefully will will bear fruit later on. Yeah, I think that'll definitely help you. Um, thank you for sharing. I also no see a lot of um, folks in chat, which is really great. So it looks like um, Jan, your organization does do disaster response. So I'm sure you. I hope some of I hope some of this is new and something for you to think about. Um, Ari and I hope I said your name right. So you raise money in Israel. Okay, wow. Yeah, you're dealing with some really unique um, disasters to what we face here. Um, but yeah, you, you're right. And I think that happens even when I worked at the Red Cross. Even as much as the Red Cross is prepared, it's still a learning experience every time. Um, because new disasters, um, new things come up that you figure out, okay, here's, here's where we have a gap. But also there's turnover in organizations. So if you've dealt with a disaster, you know, Hurricane Sandy for many organizations um, over the last few months, in another year and a half, if another disaster hits that area, which it seems like that's what continues to happen as they get worse, you're going to have some turnover by then. So you're going to face a new challenge of some of those people that had that great experience and learned those lessons now aren't there anymore. Um, so every disaster poses some new challenges um, to get over. And I think that's why a plan can be so important, especially updating it. Um, let's see, Jasmine, you set up a shelter within two days. Um, kudos. Um, Jasmine, our curiosity, is your organization one that usually um, response to disasters, or was this something where you decided and were really thrown into the mix and said, we have to do something? Because that's a really quick turnaround to get a shelter um, set up. 
Well then, <laughs> that's great work to get it up. Having set up shelters, that's a lot of work and a lot of resources to pull together. Well, thank you everyone for sharing that information. Um, here's an example of a website I found just today in Googling Hurricane Sandy appeals and updates. And this was um, a ministry organization, I believe, um, that did this. And it, there's not a lot of pictures. I will say if they had added some pictures, that would have helped break some of this up. But I think it's still manageable what they put up. It's still broken down what I liked and I put over there on the side. They use their website to offer greater detail. You would never want to put this much detail in an email or direct mail. But your website is where you can do that. Your website is where you can link people to learn more. So I like the fact that they really use their website to go into great detail about what they did. They did break it down into some bulleted sections and even um, headlines because they did response in Haiti and Cuba. So if someone was really only interested in Cuba, it was easy to scan and find that information. Um, it lists how to give at the end and includes how to designate gifts. So, so, so important if your organization is responding to the disaster or needs donations because of the disaster that you explain in very specific detail in several different areas how people give if they want to designate to the disaster. Um, uh, we all know and we've heard how the Red Cross has um, had some conflicts and problems in the past. And we learned from those mistakes and are very specific in how we tell people to designate their gifts. So I really liked that they had that in there, how you should reference that when you mail those donations in. Here's another organization that I thought was, I really liked how they laid this out. Um, clearly defined sections of information. I could scan this very easily because where it says how to help resources, it's a different color and the font is bigger than all of the, than the, than the sections and that was really helpful to be able to scan this. They used a lot of white space to make it easier to read. I love that as well. Um, they, they, I liked the red links. It made it even easier to scan. A big, big tip when you're doing even just an e-news, even for regular communications outside a disaster, don't do learn more and that's your link. Don't do read more and that's your link. Actually link a phrase or a sentence in the article or in that section that links. And why do you do that? Well, if I'm reading this and I'm scanning it and my eyes drawn to learn more which is blue or learn more which is red, that doesn't tell me anything. But if it actually, and you can see this and it's hard to see, but if you link a sentence or a phrase that's within that paragraph, I know immediately if all I'm doing is scanning and I'm picking out things that are bold or different colors, I know what I'm about to read about. That's a tip for when you're doing any type of appeal online or anything on your website. Don't use learn more, read about it more, um, go here. Uh, use something, use an actual phrase or sentence for people to link to so they can immediately see um, what it's about. And this has a really robust section on how to help and resources, and I liked that. Um, not just how to help and how to make a donation, but how to get involved and um, really get involved, whether it's in-kind donations or going and volunteering, as well as resources if you needed help or perhaps you want to, um, you're reaching out for friends that need help. That's a big thing that might happen is if you reach out to friends and say, look, I don't have a lot of communication. I can't get to the Internet. Can you try to find out, um, you know, get me some information on where I can go? Like if, for me, if a disaster struck here in Atlanta where I am, I don't have a radio. I realized that the other day. I don't have a radio in the house. So if I needed to get information and the power went out, I don't even have a radio to pop batteries in. Um, so you might have a friend reach out to you by cell phone and say, I need you to go find out where I can go. So this is a really great tool here on their website. So did we forget anyone when we talked about communications? We did. Be sure to communicate with staff. Create media talking points for your CEO or whoever the person is that's maybe going to be the spokesperson. It might be you and one other person that's going to be backup. Um, create some talking points so that everyone's on the same page. Really important, as many of you probably know, to control the flow of information out. Have a meeting to go over the disaster fundraising plan with staff, even part-timers and key volunteers. Um, 
you know, when I worked at the Boys and Girls Clubs, we didn't have regular volunteers in the office, so there wouldn't really be anyone for us to include. But when I worked at the Red Cross, we had volunteers that literally were like part-time workers. They were in the office every day during the week or three days a week. They were going to be people that we needed to have in this meeting because they were going to be stepping up and helping if something happened. Um, and even from the perspective of Boys and Girls Clubs, I wasn't there when it happened. But when those freak tornadoes went through Atlanta a few years ago, the building where the office is located, windows were blown out. Offices were, were damaged. Papers were blown out the windows. They certainly never thought they needed to be prepared. Um, so think about that. There can be some really freak disasters. Does it make sense to even put together a really brief, um, you know, maybe not as expanded disaster plan, but something in case something like that happens? Um, create a memo with all pertinent information and distribute that to staff once disaster strikes. We'll talk more tomorrow, tomorrow about what implementation looks like. So fundraising appeals. Send a three-part email appeal like any really good fundraising appeal online. Send three emails. How did, the impact, uh, how did the storm impact your organization or the disaster impact your organization to provide services if it did? Are you providing relief? Provide statistics. So this is really the same stuff I was talking to you earlier about what to communicate. Um, pictures tell a story. If you support the Red Cross or you follow the Red Cross, their pictures are amazing. They tell a great story. They do more than anything else in moving people to make a donation. Keep your story donor-centered and relatable. Um, helping 5,000 people is very different than a story about helping a family or rescuing animals. Um, tell a story someone can connect with. Be clear in your appeal about how funds will be used. Um, and consider this, an emergency appeal, whether it's direct mail or online, should be sent out within a couple of days of a disaster. Immediacy is vital. It needs to be top of mind. People need to be hearing about the disaster, seeing pictures. That's when they're most moved to do something and help. What should go in your plan when you talk about fundraising appeals? Who's responsible for writing the messages? Who's going to go into Illuminate Online and create them? Who needs to approve the messaging? Um, should there be groups that are suppressed? Who's the message from? Is it from the CEO? Um, that's something to think about and put in the plan. What about a donation form? Like any campaign, you need to have a dedicated form. Um, pay close attention to what goes at the top of that form. Again, designations. Um, don't enable sustained giving. Sounds common sense, but this is the time not to have that on a disaster donation form. Um, and up those res update those responders, uh, autoresponders to be disaster specific. It's another place to confirm how that gift is going to be used. Um, any questions about fundraising appeals before I talk about acknowledgments? Kent, was there anything you wanted I should answer and stop that was in the um, chat box? Uh, nope, not on that section. Okay. So acknowledgments, use the right language. Um, we know that donations should be acknowledged, but never more so than donations that might be for disaster relief efforts. Uh, I, it, yes, <laughs> I can't tell you how important that is. Before a disaster strikes, talk to the person or people that will process the acknowledgement letters. If you've got one person or a couple of people that are doing that, talk to them and let them know how this is going to be handled. Granted, you don't know what disaster is around the corner but you can at least talk to them in general terms about this process. What language needs to be used and changed in those thank you letters? If you are an organization that's seen disasters happen, it's part of what you do anyway, and you don't have a plan like this, have a template thank you letter um, in this plan that can then be updated with specifics about whatever disaster has just struck. But you can certainly put together a template letter with some of that wording in there for designations. How, talk about how you're going to identify disaster-only donations and general operating donations. Um, are you going to follow up with a phone call to confirm what type of gift this was? Is it just going to be the thank you letter itself? Um, we had to do that at the Red Cross in Broward County because we just couldn't call people. At the same time we were raising money, we were operating um, our emergency response vehicles, sending out 10 a day to provide them food and water. We had you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 shelters open, to, depending on the size of the disaster. Um, we weren't able to call people and confirm. So it was the thank you letter that had to have a message in there about if we didn't handle your donation correctly and you wanted to designate it differently, please call. 
talk to finance and accounting. What information do they need? Because you're going to want to talk to them. You're going to want to be able to go to them and say, how much have we collected? The media is probably going to ask. Um, and like I said, create a template for disaster thank you letters. No matter how hectic and busy things get, try to get these thank you letters out the door within five to seven business days. That two-day turnaround that is kind of the rule of thumb in the industry isn't going to work during a disaster. But if nothing else, try to have the letters out within five to seven days if you can. No more than two weeks. So looking at an in-kind policy, you really want to avert your own disaster when you're thinking about this. If you're responding to the disaster or you're impacted, you're probably going to get offers of in-kind donations. You want to put together a policy of what to accept during a disaster. Use Story Builder to create a page with information on what you need and what items you won't accept. Include a point of contact if people need to call. Link to your disaster donation form and any other pertinent pages. It's another area to perhaps link to press releases about the disaster and social media. Let staff know, especially whoever is the receptionist or fielding those front phone calls so they can refer people. Um, having this up on your website is really going to help ease the pain of volume of phone calls. Um, post a link to this page on your home page and in disaster appeals and communications you send out. Really important so if people want to give this way, they know what information to find and where to go it. Have a form for staff to fill out when accepting in-kind donations. Have copies at the front desk because people might just walk up into your organization to drop things off. They might walk up to the shelter to drop things off at the shelter. Have a form and copies of it so that those staff or those volunteers can fill out the form and send an acknowledgment later, but collect that information, as well as um, you might even have a receipt book so that person can get a receipt then and there, or at least you've got the form so you can send them a receipt later. A tip, um, create a URL shortcut to make it print friendly. So if you need to put this in flyers or put this somewhere that's going to be in print and you don't want to use that really long, awkward URL, use um, the URL short shortcut in Luminate Online to make something that's a bit more manageable. But certainly have a uh, in-kind acceptance policy because you'll get offers of all kinds of things, and I could tell you stories. And you want people in the organization to know what you will and won't take. Um, I know I'm whipping through this quick. I want to make sure we have time to cover everything and answer questions at the end if there are any. So events, you may be thinking, my gosh, we're in the middle of responding to a disaster. What do you mean an event? We're not going to throw an event. You might not, but other people might. Um, during disaster, it is common for businesses, civic and church groups, schools, and individuals to hold events to benefit organizations. They are passionate about doing it. They want to do it. Sometimes the best ones are when they don't even call you and tell you're doing it, and they just show up and give you the money. Um, having worked at the Red Cross and dealt with these events, sometimes those are the best ones. Um, because I'd have everything from people wanting to hold bake sales to they want to hold benefit concerts, and they're going to, and I kid you not, they're going to contact Beyonce, and they're going to get a hold of um, this, you know, a, a, a rock band that's really popular. And you have to love their passion and their initiative, um, but those can be a handful. And you just don't know if they're going to come to fruition. And are they going to involve you and possibly actually damage your organization's reputation? Because some of these folks go out and plan these events as if they're representatives of your organization. So be prepared for people calling or emailing saying, I want to hold an event. Use the survey tool. And we did this at the Red Cross. We put a form up using the survey tool so that we could collect inquiries from people that want to fundraise um, for the Red Cross during a disaster. And we had some doozies. <clears throat> so consider using the survey tool to put something like that up. You could even create that tomorrow have it as an unpublished survey, but it's something there so that it can be activated if you need it. Collect the information you need, evaluate the, evaluate the proposals fairly, and it helps build your house file. Examples of questions, you're thinking, OK, Danielle, but besides who, what, when, where, what do we ask for? Um, what's the projected income of the event? How will the event be promoted and publicized? 
Are the organizers planning to solicit for sponsors? If so, who? What are they expecting for turnout? What's the purpose of the, this event? That speaks to designation. Um, if they say, oh, we're expecting 5,000 people, there's a really good chance they're not going to have 5,000 people. Um, why do you want to know who they're soliciting for sponsors? That is a completely okay answer, question to ask because if you're an organization that has partnerships and support from major corporations in your area, even if you're in a small town, you still have major businesses that support you. If someone turns this form in and they say, here are the organizations, and you look at that and go out of the five they want to contact, three of those support us, you're going to want to turn around if you approve this event and say, we approve it with the caveat that X, Y, and Z, and one of those being, we ask that you not solicit these three companies because they already support our organization and they've already given a disaster gift. So that's a really important question to ask. Put it in writing. I really encourage you to do this to protect your organization and to be very clear with the event organizer. Put together an agreement. How much this could stand up in court, that's questionable because it's not certainly, you could certainly have a lawyer look at this. But if anything, what it really is, one thing, this survey, this form, is really going to make people pause that want to hold these events for you and really make them think through, oh, okay, wow. You know what, I'm just going to hold this event and give them the money. Like I said, sometimes those are the best. Or it's going to make them maybe step back and go, okay, wow, this is, this is a lot more involved than I thought. Maybe not the best thing for me to do. And putting it in writing for those ones that you do approve, it, you're going to include things like the date and location of the event. Who is the organizer and their contact information? Spell out that they agree to pay all costs of this event. They don't turn around, and sometimes they will, unfortunately, and ask your organization, well, but we were doing this for you. Aren't you going to help us pay for it? Spell it out in the agreement. And that funds will be distributed to your organization within two weeks, within 30 days, within 60 days. Those are things you need to decide. But this is really important stuff to put in writing. If you don't want to put a quote-unquote agreement together, then at least send them a letter on your letterhead addressed to them with some of this information bulleted out of what they're doing and that your organization approves it. Another reason this is important is because if a media um, contact calls you and says, look, we heard about this company and they're holding an event for you, is this legitimate? You'll be able to say, yes, we have an agreement with them. This is an event that we're aware of. Or, and I've had this happen, we had, um, when I was in Broward County, Florida, people were out at the um, auditorium at an event with buckets saying they were raising for the Red Cross. We had no idea what that was. I don't know that we ever received that money. So the um, event facility was able to call us and say, are these folks yours? And we were able to turn around and look through our paperwork and go, no. That's not to say it's actually coming, not going to come back to the Red Cross, but we can't tell you that we even know or that it's legitimate. So that, that, that facility, that stadium, was able to turn around and ask those people to leave or to question them. Um, so that's why it's so important to think about third-party events. Um, they can kind of come at you and, and um, really come out of left field, and you might not be prepared for them. So we've got five minutes left. Any questions before we wrap up? And that link down there um, is where we're going to post the slides, so you can download the slides and the recording when it's ready, and you can also ask questions. Ken, anything you want to bring up or point out based on what we talked about today? I know you've dealt with your share of, of disasters as well. Um, not a whole lot. I, you actually went in pretty deep on a lot of the stuff. Just from my experience, um, you know, I worked at the animal well in the animal welfare industry uh, vertical, and so uh, my biggest examples would be when Katrina hit in Louisiana, and we had all of the uh, the animals coming into Texas from Louisiana, and the way that we had to prepare for that. And, and just like you mentioned in, in a lot of your stuff about using Story Builder and allow you know utilizing that functionality. That, that's something I definitely recommend, and it's something that we actually have in the kit that we'll, we'll show tomorrow for a lost and found element. Um, but definitely utilizing, just utilizing the base functionality has always been the key part when I was on the client side of disaster response. Just having just basic functionality 
but just having things set up ready to go when it did happen. So it never was really any magical type of use of the tool or anything, but just using it to its fullest. Thanks so much. Um, and I am covering a lot of information today. So if you think of other questions, feel free to post them in the community. Um, I will also, after we're done with this, because there's so much more I could go into, um, um, just based on not only doing disaster operations firsthand on the ground, but I also worked with Red Cross chapters teaching them how to prepare and helping them implement plans. Um, I'll certainly think about once, we're, once I'm done with these two webinars, if there's some more information I could um, possibly post um, just as food for thought in the community, I'll certainly write that down. So we've completed day one and covered a lot of information about what goes in a disaster fundraising plan. There are certainly more sections you could add, um, but these are really the biggest ones and the most important ones you need to think about putting in writing and talking to people and making some de decisions to give you some peace of mind, but also to equip your staff with the tools. Um, day two, what we'll talk about tomorrow is implementation. Um, the disaster has happened, now what? So we'll just talk about those first couple of days, what needs to happen, what needs to go on. And then we're going to talk about donor conversion. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of print pieces. I'm going to show you some examples of online. I'm going to give you an example of a strategy that I developed and put in place and within, oh, it's been a while. I think it was either three or six months I was able to convert corporate disaster-only donors to give six figures to the Red Cross. And I'll talk to you also about an example of a third-party event that was a young girl raising a few hundred dollars and how that turned into a partnership with one of the most influential corporations and in Indian tribes in Florida. So I'll talk to you about that just to show you the opportunity that exists in even some of those smallest donors. Um, and then I'll, we'll talk about what's in the kit, and we'll walk through what's in there. And like I said, Kent has put together, and his colleague Ken have put together a really extensive, great kit. Um, I'm excited about what's in here. We've tried to put a lot of bells and whistles and tools that you can use um, to cut down on your work. So we'll go over that tomorrow as well. So that is it for today. I, I hope that you got some new information out of here and some food for thought and things that you've jotted down and gone, oh, yeah, we, we need to do that. Um, I hope you've gotten something out of this, and I appreciate your time. Thanks. All right, thanks, everyone. And like I said, Kent will follow up with the recording when it's ready in a, um, probably a few hours. Yep, absolutely. Look for an email coming your way probably in about the next hour. So if you don't get an email, please email me at luminatecommunity at blackbot.com, and I can send you a copy just in case you're, you're uh, not receiving our emails. So thank you for attending. <laughs>